A lot of pictures, it's kind of exciting. Uh, at that point, we were just launching the Windows desktop on motherboards that were running phone processors. So processors like Tegra 2 and Medfield. And that was a really important demonstration. It was short, but it was important because what it said is that we're going to have, you know, it's better like, um, we are going to have a new generation of PCs that have a power profile more like a phone. So they'll run in what's called connected standby. In connected standby, your PC not only starts up fast and shuts down fast and stays in standby for a long time on one charge, while it's in standby, it's syncing all the time. So you turn your PC on and you have your mail. You turn your PC on and you have the text messages or the other kinds of communications that came in while your PC was asleep. These PCs are the same windows. That's what's making this so cool. I'm going to show you some of the things that Julie did, and you will see that it's the same. So here's my lock screen. You can see that up on the screen. When I swipe up, I have a picture password of my daughter. One, two, three steps to log in. And you can see that what I get to is the same start screen. It's fast, it's fluid, it works well with touch, and it's running a lot of the same apps that you saw Julie using. Yeah, so just really quick, I want to make sure you see some of the hardware that we have on, on display here. Mike is holding uh, the NVIDIA Tegra 3, which we're, we're really excited. It's quad core. We have the next generation Snapdragon from Qualcomm, and we also have the, the next generation of OMAP from TI as well. And over here, we have the Intel SoC Clover Trail. And all of these are showing the same progress that we're showing in the x86, uh, the x86 software as well. These are the chips we're going to go to market with. These are the chips we're going to support. And all four of these platforms, the PCs built on these platforms, will be able to do this connected standby. <laughs> you know, the reason that this is really the same UI as Windows is because it's the same code. Yeah, we, we built this. One of the unique uh, points of view that we had in developing our approach on ARM was that we wanted to use the same kernel, the same OS software across all of the different ARM platforms. And that really benefits the breadth of the ecosystem and it allows customers to just very easily stay up to date, keep all of their, their PCs running with the latest and greatest of, of the apps and the OS. And they'll work and they'll feel the same too. That shared code goes all the way through to include Internet Explorer, for example. So here's ID. You can see it's the same kind of fast and fluid browsing. I can swipe here, I can get to my tabs. This is that short blog post you were talking about, the 8,000 words in it. I have an HTML5 video. 600 tweets. 600 tweets. Um, you can kind of see that video is playing in frame. It's fast and it's fluid. It's, of course, hardware accelerated graphics. So it's not only the best for browsing the web, it's also great for apps. So I'm going to launch the USA Today app. And what you'll see is it looks the same as the app on Antoine's system because it's the same app. It's the same code. So a developer that writes a Windows app and they write it uh, and put it up in the, the store can ship it to customers of ARM systems as well as on x86 systems with the same code. And the store will handle that and you'll just be able to pick the right apps at the right time for ARM or x86. That's right. The compatibility is going to be really easy on hardware too, for example. So things like some of these are connected to printers, keyboards, and mics. Yeah, so one of the biggest innovations uh, that we did to, to help to deliver this is we developed a, a new level of class driver, we call it. A class driver allows something like 80 or 90 percent of all the printers to just work by plugging them into this device and the driver will download automatically or, or it's not going to install no automatically. Yeah. It's just right there, works, and it works for a broad range of devices. So when you pop in a keyboard or a mouse or a printer or a USB storage or external storage of other, any kind, it just works, just like you would expect. And there's no extra work, no extra hunting around for drivers or things like that. And then that becomes really useful when you've like docked one of these systems and you have a keyboard and a mouse and you go to the desktop because you want to be able to manage your files directly. In this case, I'm showing Office. So this is Office 15. So this is PowerPoint. I'm switching slides. You can see that it's live. It's editing. I can switch over to Word. So Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote all running natively here, which gets really useful as a PC when you're sitting down to do work. Right, and those are the, the full versions of those, of those applications. And they same document format compatibility, same feature set, and that is their x86 counterparts. 
And it really shows the power of just having the, the operating system there to support all those scenarios. And as we mentioned in the blog, those have been tuned uh, in a very significant way for uh, touch capabilities as well. But they inherit all of the keyboard and mouse and the precision so that you can just choose. That's true. We're making the same kind of progress like you mentioned on all of these platforms. So here on the OMAP system, I can um, start one of the games that you saw in the, um, in the movie. And I can play with my joystick here. You can see asteroids flying around. Um, this is the, the Intel system I was talking about. So you can see how fast connected standby works. So the PC's off, the PC's on. It's just that fast. It's responsive. It's running the same um, apps that you saw Julie show. So there's a Windows app, the iCookbook app. And when I go back to start, you realize that this can also run all of the desktop software that already exists for Windows PC. So on the Intel platform, it's really everything. Right, so for the enterprise that has a line of business, or if you're a professional and you have you know, dedicated utilities or devices, all of that runs completely on that x86 Clover Trail machine. But at the same time, it brings with it the next generation of a mobile platform. And those mobile platforms are super power efficient. So it took us work, some pretty significant engineering work in Windows 8 to be able to run on, in essence, phone platforms. Windows 8 had to be smaller. It uses less CPU, it uses less memory. Uh, the disk footprint here is smaller. There are fewer services running, fewer processes, fewer threads running. And we've done a bunch of work to make sure that features like uploading and downloading files or syncing via USB or getting email, all of these kinds of background tasks are now really heavily resource managed so that they never block the user experience. So all of this, plus of course the DX hardware accelerated graphics are what's making it possible for Windows to run really well at the same experience on this class of device. Now, these are not PCs that you'll buy. These are developer uh, reference devices. So just like the PC that Julie was talking about that we customized with Samsung, these are devices that, that partners get to develop either PCs or applications. And we're gonna have a special seeding program. I, I thank the partners here a lot, uh, including AT&T, who's providing mobile broadband on these. It's gonna be a great program. It's for a specific set of uh, hardware and software de developers, and that'll be starting soon. So I'm going to move on now to some Ultrabook stuff. So you mentioned the categories emerged. It's, it is a new form factor. And then even if you don't have the keyboard attached, what, what does it mean if you can attach a keyboard or a mouse to a device and it becomes a, a fully capable PC? All of the precision of the mouse is there. All of your keyboard shortcuts are there. Your productivity is there. It's more than just being able to type faster. You can do the broad range of capabilities of, of the software in a, in a much richer and deeper, deeper way. And so we're going to see touch making sense in a whole bunch of new, new form factors. And I think you'll see the form factors start adapting as people are using them with touch. So an example here, this is a, an all-in-one. This is a Windows 8 style touch sensor. So this is flat capacitive glass with no bezel. It's really pretty. It's very responsive. I can be playing a game like this but what's neat is that, like with Surface, we learned, especially when using it with multiple people, you can just pull it down like this, and now we can be working together. So we side. basically just turned this productivity-looking desktop into a multiplayer gaming station just by flipping the hinge. Or a drafting or table. Or a drafting table for a professional architect or a student. That's right. And, and this is the, the fascinating thing. You know, um, when the mouse first came out, the Microsoft mouse, by the way, this week, turns 30 years old. That's right. So it's very exciting to think about you know, the history of the mouse and the Microsoft's uh, contribution to that. But you know, it's hard to imagine not having a mouse. And yet when mice first came out, they were relatively controversial. And more importantly, like, you couldn't find a place to put it on your desk. If you were a computer user then, you remember your return, if you remember that word, on your desk, didn't have room for a mouse. And what happened was that your whole work environment changed. And it, so it's not a static view of the world. And so when you see a, a PC like this, don't think about it fitting into the, the world you have now. You know, oh, I'm never going to sit here and hold my arms straight out. Well, to bring the PC to you. Right, bring the PC to you. Tilt it down. Build new furniture that allows new capabilities. You can, oh, thank you. You can, you can pull this map around. I can zoom myself way out. You can pull out the charm again and get right back to the desktop. But what makes this PC cool is 10 people could be using this PC at the same time. It's supporting 100 fingers on touch. It's got a sub-pixel accuracy pen. It's 82-inch diagonal piece of optically bonded Gorilla Glass. That's the biggest one in the world. That title was held by Surface as recently as last year. Surface V2 at 
40 inches. So you can see how quickly this is changing and how quickly you're going to see touch. You already see touch like this on television all the time. And one of the things that's so neat about this is there's no parallax because of the bonding. So there's really no gap between where my finger is and where I feel like the pixels are. So I actually feel like I'm moving this tile directly by hand. And that's what makes this also natural. This is like, it, it, it stick to your finger touch, but like the size of a wall. Yeah. And it's a wild experience to come up here and touch this and, and really experience what it's like. And Mike was talking about the parallax. Well, that matters a, a great deal when you start to use a pen on this, if this was a whiteboard or a, a, different, kind of, uh, a different kind of application or scenario. Well, what's really impressive about this is this is really just the touch screen. Any Windows PC can run this. In fact, the Windows 8 PCs that are powerful enough for this experience are starting to come in some of the most unbelievably small packages. So this PC was so small that it got hung up in customs because they didn't actually believe it was a full PC. This was only released like a couple of days ago. And it's a, it's a dual core AMD system. It's a full power system. It's got dual digital outputs. It's got all the ports that you want. And this little PC can run this size experience. Right, and you can mount it behind it. And, yeah. really, and, and that kind of flexibility where, you know, over time you can change out the PC, change the display, all of that is just an important part of being able to build really flexible designs. I'm going to show some of the flexibility in the design. So I've got one of these PCs here that's already connected. This PC is actually connected to these two um, show screens. So what you're looking at here is this PC driving these two screens in multiple monitor mode. So this is the Windows desktop spanning two screens. And, and we've done a few features. This is what kind of an enthusiast feature where you want to be able to have different backgrounds on different screens or run different slideshows. Or in this case, I'm going to launch the Explorer here. And as I drag it to that screen, watch that taskbar that's empty right now. You can see the taskbar icon for Explorer follows the window depending on which screen it is. So these are just some doing a great job uh, with early, early examples of the kind of capabilities that they're going to be able to take advantage of in, in Windows 8. You know, the, the SOC PCs will enable a next generation in PC designs. Thinner, lighter, longer battery life. It's, just, it's an awesome opportunity for us. The, the ARM reference designs that, that we, we showed up here, those are in testing and making the same progress as our, our x86 and 60. But it's a little early, and a lot of dynamic nature of the app world is about to, about to be downloaded and experienced. We really have showed the cloud connection across all of your Windows PCs. Uh, here at Mobile World Congress, we show a lot of your Windows Phone 7, 5 connecting up to SkyDrive, to your Hotmail accounts, to all of your identity. All of that roaming is just totally seamless. So when you first sign on with your Windows Live ID, it carries with you across all of your all of your bit of a, of a yearning. We all desire something a little bit better. You know, in our day-to-day -day lives with, with all of these devices, we face too many choices where we have to choose between things, this or that. We're choosing between consumption or productivity. We're choosing between more battery life or more functionality. We're choosing between form factors, a tablet or a laptop. You know, even something very simple, we have to choose. Do you want a touch interface or do you want a keyboard and mouse? And even when you try to mix those, it's, it's complicated and it's not, not yet natural. And I think what the challenge is, is that our industry has made you make this choice based on the capabilities of the operating system. And really, you should get to make this choice, the choice that you want of a form factor, based on the form factor. What is it you want to get done? What is it you want to carry with you? How do you want to be mobile? How do you want your desktop to work? And you want to have this, these capabilities no matter where you are and how you're working. Patients that I have running, and I can quickly choose the one that I want to go to, and just out of the list. Another fast and fluid motion that we have is to close an app. You don't really need to close apps in Windows 8. We'll talk about that a little later. But if you do want to close it, you just take your finger from the top, drag it down, and right off the screen. That's really fast and fluid, that notion of fast and fluid. And down and back again. One of the nice things about this automatic snapping between two windows is that I don't have to manage the windows. They don't overlap on top of each other. And so when I do something like click a link, it's going to go right to Internet Explorer without have me having to manage where that went. It's no different. That device that Julie is using over there is a great example of just one type of PC that PC manufacturers will be making for Windows 8. When you go back home or back to your office or your hotel at the end of the day and you install the consumer preview and you download it, you'll probably be installing it on a machine that's more like this one. So this is a laptop. 
It's just like the hundreds of millions of existing Windows 7 laptops will be able to run Windows 8 and run the, the consumer preview. This one actually is, uh, this is a Lenovo U300S. So this is one of these uh, latest generation Ultrabooks that we love so much. They're wonderful machines. They're light, they're small, they're thin, they have great battery life, they're powerful. Um, it's, it's a mouse and keyboard machine. I'm just going to move the mouse to the bottom left corner. So this feels natural because this is what you do in Windows today, right? If you want to move, if you want to start an app, you go to the start button, and the start button is just down in the bottom left corner. So I just move down there and I click, and I'm back at the start screen. Here, let's start another app. This is my calendar. If we go back down to the left, same thing. We'll start another one here. See how easy this all is? I can just, it's incredibly fast and fluid to just navigate this UI and go back to the start, start screen this way. Right? So uh, one of the things that Julie showed was Zooming. Zoom actually works really, is really, really convenient with the mouse as well. So I can go down to the bottom right corner where that little magnifying glass is, click, and I zoom out. Now I can scroll around my, uh, my start menu to see what I, my start screen, see what I'm interested in. Here's the Kindle app from Amazon. This is also a great Metro style app. We're really excited to have this one. And again, back to the start screen incredibly easily. Right? Uh, Zoom is actually great also for rearranging the start screen. So if I want to take, for example, this news group and just drag it around and bring it over here, incredibly easy to do. Rearranging individual tiles is really easy. I can just tear them off, move them around. This works exactly as you'd expect. Actually, watch what happens here as I move it down. The start screen zooms out automatically, and then I can just go where I want to drop it and really, really easy move it, easily move it over there. Right? So very, very easy to do. Now, I started something like four or five apps here. Uh, obviously, we've got a multitasking operating system. One of the things that you might want to do is just switch between apps that you have running in the background. So watch how we're going to do this. I'm going to take the mouse and I'm going to move it to the top left corner. And just by clicking, I switch to my previous app that I had up, right? I can switch to the next one. See how easy this is? Just super fast and fluid. I can cycle through my apps, go back to the start screen, go back to the app I was at. It's all incredibly, incredibly easily. It just made these corners make it really, really easy to just move around the UI like that. I'll show you another thing. If I move the mouse up to that top left corner and just drag it down, now I get that switch list that Julie showed you. Right now I've got all my running apps here. I can just pick the one that I'm interested in switching to, and there I am. Bang, I'm back where I was, back at the start screen. So fast, fluid, easy to move around. Let me show you, let's start another app here. So this is, uh, this is a finance app here. So this actually uses um, the power of Bing to aggregate a whole bunch of financial and economic information and present it in this very beautiful and, and, and full screen, easy to read way. Um, let's scroll over a little bit. I just want to give you a sense of how easy these kinds of apps are to navigate with the mouse. So again, I could just pan around. We can go see maybe a monthly view here. That's actually not a bad view of the market. Um, and I can just go click. I can hover over this, for example, and get individual data points. So this works exactly as you would expect it to. Very, very, it's just as easy to navigate these apps and navigate the system with the mouse as it is to do with your fingers. How far along you are, how fast things are going, and things like that. Uh, let's copy another one here for fun. Oops. Select it, and now what you'll see is actually both of them show up all the there. So we aggregate these copies at the same time. It's not just prettier and more informative. I can do things, for example, I can pause this one. Like say, let's say I want the I want the second one to go to finish first and go faster. I can pause the top one, and now it's got the bottom. It lets the bottom one go first. Uh, it's also smarter in other ways. For example, one of the things that happens sometimes you start copying these large files, and maybe you close the lid on your machine and it goes to sleep, right? Uh, one of the things that Copy knows how to do now is to actually recover properly from that and resume, a, resume copying if it, uh, if it needs to. Now, that's the desktop. It's still there. It's great. It's improved in a lot of ways. And it's completely integrated with Windows 8. It's you know, we built Windows 8 so that you don't have to compromise across form factors, across types of input. You get to work the way that you want to work. The Windows operating system is there to make this all possible for you. It's the one and only operating system that you can use that spans all of these capabilities and so that you can truly pick the form factor that you want to use without compromising. We showed you a bunch of apps in these demonstrations. Uh, these are the, the preview apps. Um, I do want to kind of say what that means to us. The apps are sort of a milestone behind the operating system. So when the operating system at this point is, is definitely at the consumer preview level. The apps, sort of at the app preview level. And that collection of apps that you saw, the, the ones that are, that are shipping with the, the download, all subject to a little bit of change, 
They're all going to be updated along the way. New apps will come into the store. So it's just early. I would probably not think now is a good time to start reviewing the apps or listing the apps or categorizing them and things like that. It's just a, a little bit a little bit early. Many of our amazing hardware partners are here with us today. And we're working in, in new ways to bring new levels of, <coughs> of capabilities, uh, industrial design, form factors, creativity, and differentiation across the, the broad range of hardware that, that Windows can, can support. And so we want to preview some of the capabilities that, that our partners have been, been working on. You know, we, we did a, a blog post on, on Windows on ARM. Um, it was about uh, 650 tweets. And so we, what we wanted to do was really show uh, reimagining Windows for SOCs, or system on a chip. Uh, the power efficiency of modern mobile devices uh, comes together with the capabilities of a, a Windows PC. A no compromise across ARM and with Office, apps, and devices. And we wanted to make sure you saw, you see some of the progress in the hardware ecosystem and for developers. You know, you can access uh, from anywhere on the best mobile platforms that have ever existed. The work that our partners have, have done, the, the work that Intel has really led on Ultrabooks, it, is simply incredible. It's some of the best hardware engineering and industrial design that our PC partners have ever done with the support of, of Intel. And so we want to make sure to talk about the choices and the creativity going on there. You know, and from the very start of the Windows 8 project, we designed it to meet the needs of a broad range of customers, and in particular, the role of professionals, people who live in front of a PC, multiple monitors, desktops, that scaling out, scaling up of the Windows platform is an integral part of the design of Windows 8. The Windows 8 Enterprise features that upcoming CBIT. And so we'll dive into features like Windows to Go and the broad range of enterprise capabilities for managing, controlling, and using Windows 8 in an enterprise environment. In fact, I'm pretty sure the network hiccuped right when the build went live. And so you can go download it now on preview.windows.com. Not only is there software and, and the images with the preview apps and the store, but there's a broad range of new information for developers, a broad range of, of new documentation, as well as